This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to extend a special welcome to members of our military and their families who are joining us from other countries over the Internet. Thank you for making us part of your news week. In just a moment, our nation's foremost advocate for whistleblower protection, Mr. Stephen M. Cohn, will be joining us to talk about the laws that do and do not protect citizens who come forward to report wrongdoing by corporations and the government. Hang on to your hats, because when it comes to exposing misconduct, whistleblowers often pay a big price for doing the right thing. So today, we're going to find out if there is a right and a wrong way for them to come forward. But before Mr. Cohn joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Stephen Martin Cohn received his undergraduate degree from Boston University, his master's from Brown University, and law degree from Northwestern University. Following graduation, he served as an adjunct professor at the Antioch School of Law, where he oversaw a clinic on whistleblower protection. He also served as the director of corporate litigation for the Government Accountability Project. By 1988, Cohn was ready to strike out on his own. He joined forces with his brother to form the law firm of Cohn, Cohn, and Colapinto. The firm was known for defending the rights of employees and government workers who came forward to disclose nuclear safety issues as well as government fraud. Mr. Cohn has been representing whistleblowers and giving expert testimony before Congress for 30 years on cases ranging from the World Trade Center and Oklahoma City bombing cases to the supervisor of the FBI crime lab who came forward concerning tainted evidence being used by prosecutors. I would be remiss if I did not mention that Mr. Cohn is a prolific author. He has also been a guest on ABC World News, 60 Minutes, Hardball, CNN, and other news programs. And he is the executive director of the National Whistleblower Center and trustee of the National Whistleblower Legal Defense and Education Fund. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report one of our nation's foremost experts on the do's and don'ts of whistleblowing, Mr. Stephen Cohn. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Cohn. Well, thank you so much. And that introduction is kind of... uh... That's overwhelming, but thank you for that. (laughs) Well, I think your background is overwhelming uh, compared to most of us. Um, Now, I uh, have to say that uh, I've noticed that any time we talk about whistleblowers on this program, the audience is pretty split. Half think uh, the whistleblower is a traitor, and the other half think that they're a hero. So let me open today's program with a very basic question. What's the difference between a whistleblower and a traitor? Well, the difference is that debate is old. All of the studies show that the number one source for all fraud detection, all corruption detection, are whistleblowers. When I say number one, overwhelming source of that information. So what I like to say now is love them or hate them. It doesn't matter. If you want an effective anti-corruption, anti-fraud program, you must bring out the whistleblowers. And the the numbers are staggering. Today, 80% of all fraud recoveries for people ripping off the United States government come from whistleblowers. The attorney generals have all come out and said, number one source of information. The head of the SEC has said it's phenomenal phenomenal. In the IRS, when they did a whistleblower law there, they busted Swiss banking for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. So love them or hate them, whistleblowing works. And here's an amazing thing. The professors at the University of Chicago School of Economics, which is not a liberal think tank, studied fraud detection and issued a report And they concluded that whistleblowers are absolutely essential. And then they had the funniest little conclusion. And what they said was, they said, there is no incentive for people to blow the whistle. It's all a downside. So if you want whistleblower, if you want a fraud program to be able to detect fraud, you have to incentivize 
whistleblowers. You have to reward whistleblowers with monetary compensation. So these, the, the, the Chicago School of Economics not only endorsed whistleblowers, they went further in light of how fraud is actually detected in the real world. So what I say to those who don't like whistleblowers, get over it. <laughs> if you want corruption, yeah, go back right. to your old ways. Well, this seems to be a time when we need more oversight than ever. And uh, and so I do believe you've got to incentivize that kind of behavior if you expect more of it. So let me ask you this. How about an informant? Are the laws which protect informants, are, are those different from those that protect whistleblowers? Uh, yes. Uh, an informant is generally someone who was involved in a criminal enterprise and often in exchange for not being prosecuted or for a reduction in penalty, turns evidence against their colleagues. And that is perfectly fine. Uh, you know, and, and it's a successful law enforcement tactic. Mm -hmm. But whistleblowing is completely different. What that is, is it tries to get insiders to whom the government doesn't know because you don't become the whistleblower unless you have original information. So if, if the government is already doing a prosecution and find someone and they squeeze them and get them to become an informant, they won't qualify. The, the whistleblower is the person who steps out with original information, and that information becomes the key to initiating the case and prosecuting the case. Now, in many That's cases, yeah, in many cases, such as Edward Snowden's case, for example, a whistleblower is contractually or legally bound not to disclose confidential information. Isn't that where things get tricky? Well, here's how it goes. There is a federal obstruction of justice statute that says nobody can be harmed economically if they give truthful information to law enforcement about a criminal activity. That, and if you retaliate against that person, you fire them, that is a criminal offense, 10 years in prison. This sets forth national public policy. So what that is telling you is if a whistleblower like Snowden or any other whistleblower has information about a possible criminal violation, and they give that information to the appropriate law enforcement authority, they cannot be retaliated against, they cannot be sanctioned, no confidentiality agreement can stop that, and they have that right. So if you go to the press, if you go outside of law enforcement, well, then you're in the slippery slope. You, you, it depends on the law. It depends on what you're disclosing. You may or may not be protected. But w w the way we look at these non-disclosure agreements and the requirements for confidentiality, the way we look at it is what are you blowing the whistle on? If it's criminal, let's do it right. Let's get it to law enforcement. If it's not criminal, we have to evaluate what your rights are where they begin and end to protect the whistleblower so they don't make a disclosure and have their life ruined. Well, I understand. And, uh, you know, you say that their people are protected uh, if there's a violation of the law, but you better be sure there's been a violation of the law and how many people are really equipped to make that evaluation on their own without proper legal counsel. I think we all think we know the law, but then, uh, you know, you dig a little deeper and the law is a very technical vehicle. So sometimes what you think may be right may not be protected at all. Now we have to take our first scheduled break. When we come back, we're going to find out the most common mistake whistleblowers make. You're listening to the Costa Report. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. 
But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. Big data is being generated by everything around us all the time. Every digital process and social media exchange produce it. Systems, sensors, and mobile devices transmit it. Big data is arriving from multiple sources with ever-increasing velocity, volume, and variety. It's becoming the world's newest resource for competitive advantage, allowing decision-making to move from the elite few to the empowered many. The escalating demand for insights requires a fundamentally new approach to architecture, tools, and practices. To extract meaningful value from big data, you need optimal processing power, analytics capabilities, and skills. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. That's www.ibm.com slash big data. Hey, buddy, it's me, your laptop. That's right, your little modern marvel of technology you've been abusing for months. Dude, we need to talk. Do you really think that those free PC fix-it programs are any match for today's spyware and malware? Not to mention the NSA and some of those websites you've been visiting. Now, I'm not here to judge. I'm just saying. You need to take me to Peter and the friendly staff at User-Friendly Computing to get me back into tip-top shape. Tired of unfriendly computer support, slow computer, viruses, spyware? No problem. Call the friendly computer experts at User-Friendly Computing. We take care of all your PC, Macintosh, and laptop needs. Mention KSCO and get a free $50 diagnostic. Visit us today at 505 River Street on the way to downtown Santa Cruz across from Gateway Plaza. We give you a choice. Drop your computer by the shop, or we'll come to you. Call us today at 423-9653. User-friendly computing. Do you have a plan for your money? Does your money come and go like the tides? Do you just leave your finances to fate? Cash is always flowing. Money is always moving. And if you don't manage it, it will move away from you. So many people actually spend more time planning their next trip to the dentist then they do something even more important, like their retirement. You know what they say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Don't leave your financial future to fate. Take charge. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Money Moves is dedicated to providing you tips and tools so you can manage your own money effectively. No one cares about your money more than you do. Therefore, you need the skills to manage your money. Listen to Money Moves every Thursday at 7 p.m. here on KSCO AM 1080. Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is one of our nation's premier authorities on whistleblower protection, Mr. Stephen Cohn. And before the break, I brought up the case of Edward Snowden. And while the Federal Obstruction of Justice Act protects whistleblowers who report criminal offenses to law enforcement, it was explained to me that having a good reason for disclosing confidential information is not necessarily a defense, and the court uh, is only there to determine whether you broke the law or not, and whether not whether you had a good reason to. So it sounds like it'd be very difficult to mount a defense for Edward Snowden. Uh, Mr. Snowden, his case raises a lot of complex issues, and the, the unfortunate part of it is that the national security establishment 
in 1978 got an exclusion from whistleblower laws. They put it in the Civil Service Act saying that companies like or agencies like the NSA and the CIA are excluded. So you have no whistleblower rights. Right. And and that exclusion really created a terrible situation where those agencies have terrible cultures. It, in other words, so so even it, they didn't never developed a culture where whistleblowing was accepted or where there were safe and effective channels to raise a concern. We warned year after year that if you don't have safe and effective channels, and those channels can fully protect confidential information, but if you don't have that. It's only a question of time before you're going to have some American who's going to be so upset about what they think is wrongdoing. They're going to go out there and going to blow the whistle in a way that you don't like. And guess what? Their life will be ruined and U.S. security may be harmed. But it's inevitable because people do blow the whistle. They do get upset when they see wrongdoing. And so, that's really so now what's happened? Of, it's, that's the tragedy right. of the Snowden case. I think everyone's a loser. It, it's it's happened. And, you know, as a result of it, there have been tremendous changes in public awareness. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be any defense that can be mounted for, uh, for him that would be acceptable in a current court of law. Is that incorrect? That, okay, he does have a defense. What is it? The First Amendment, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. There are cases in which the Supreme Court has said that if a government worker blows the whistle and there's no law protecting it, so you, all you have is the Constitution, the courts are supposed to weigh the public right to know versus the government's interest in secrecy. I believe, whether that happens in open court or pretrial proceedings, that would be the place where Snowden and his allies could explain that the NSA program they blew the whistle on was ineffective. There's tremendous evidence out there that it didn't stop any terrorist crimes. They were collecting too much data. It was a failure. So therefore, the government's interest in keeping it secret is less because the program just didn't work. That's what their people say. On the other hand, the people's interest, the public interest in knowing about it in terms of the systemic violation of privacy rights, the systemic constitutional violations, and the fact that we know that Congress was in fact lied to, that the public interest in learning that would outweigh the secrecy. That may happen in some like off, you know, uh, uh, hearing under seal, but under the First Amendment, there is that balancing test because the Supreme Court has recognized that all because the government says the people can't know, that doesn't mean the people can't know. There has to be a check on the government's ability to just declare something secret and shut the door and keep all the voters in, 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 in ignorance. So I believe that if he were to come forward, that there would be that that type of procedure he would be constitutionally entitled to, uh, and then we see where it, how it all develops. We essentially through that procedure we can see, you know, was there were there real harms to national security? Were there real public interests in having this exposed? And get all the answers. Well, now in retrospect, looking at how Edward Snowden went about revealing the information he did, I'm sure that had he been able to talk to someone like you, he would have done things differently. So you've been representing whistleblowers for over 30 years. So what's the most common mistake they make when they decide to come forward? And, and I'm glad you asked that. And that's why I wrote that the book, The Whistleblower's Handbook. It's precisely because I've been doing this for many years, and the most heartbreaking part of my job has been meeting with whistleblowers who are in good faith, who wanted to do the right thing, but because of mistakes they made, have already lost their cases because they didn't blow the whistle in the right way. Most people don't understand that there's 50 different whistleblower laws. Each one defines whistleblowing in a different way. You go to a different agency, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a mess. But the laws, there's no big whistleblower law that just protects everybody. It's these 
very specific laws. Some are fantastic, state-of-the-art. They let you get rewards. They let you be confidential. They're just the best whistleblower laws out there. And some, to be perfectly frank, are garbage. They're old. They don't work. You don't get any damages. And, and what's key is when the whistleblower comes forward, the key issue is what are you blowing the whistle on? And therefore, how can you do it legally and, and gain the maximum protection? So that is, are the key issues. And that should happen before you blow the whistle. Because once you go somewhere, once you make a disclosure, cat's out of the bag. And, and if you did it in the wrong way, you can't bring that back. You can't fix it. So be it Snowden or anyone else, the key is to learn what your rights are. And even if you think you have no rights, guess what? You may have some rights. Now, in your whistleblower's handbook, you lay out 21 basic rules. And we're not going to have time today to go through all 21. What's the number one rule, the golden rule? Well, the golden rule is to, before you blow the whistle, learn what laws protect you so you know who to go to and how to get there lawfully. But right next to it, because that, that is rule number one, but rule number two is called follow the money. And I was going to make rule number two rule number one. It really should be. Because the best whistleblower laws today all look at fraud. They look at like tax fraud, securities fraud, foreign corruption, bank fraud, uh, fraud in government contracting, Medicare, Medicaid fraud. Those are the best laws. They all tie into greed and money. But if you look at most whistleblower cases, people are retaliated against, mm -hmm. not because their manager is some evil doctor, evil person who is like, you know, and those stereotypes are terrible. It's usually all about the money. It's it usually costs you. somebody something. It costs somebody. And in one of the earliest whistleblower cases, the judge said safety costs money. Mm -hmm. So if you, when the whistleblower sits down and you kind of think through mm -hmm. the money issue, you can often find a really good law. Very good. I, I like that. Follow the money and uh, you'll find out who's going to be affected by you blowing the whistle. And that's probably going to give you a good indication of how you ought to go about things. We have to take another commercial break. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from Stephen Cohn. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Second Harvest Food Bank is throwing their annual Hunger Hoedown on Sunday, July 31st, featuring live music by the Backyard Blues Band and Coffee Zombie Collective. Kids' activities, great food, local beer and wine, and much more. So grab the family and come on down to the Hunger Hoedown. All the fun helps support the food bank and feed people in need in our community. It's Sunday, July 31st, 3 to 7 p.m. at Second Harvest Food Bank in Watsonville. Get discounted tickets in advance at thefoodbank.org. Sponsored in part by KSCO Radio. When it comes to selecting a doctor, dentist, or an accountant, we all want to know who is going to take care of us, right? So before you select a gunsmith, I invite you to drop by Del Valle Gunsmithing and get to know us. Hello, I'm Ray Parga, owner of Del Valle Gunsmithing in Marina. I am very proud of the reputation we have earned in our 30 years of service to the Central Coast community of gun owners and soon-to-be gun owners. Drop by and get to know us. We are at 224 Rhinedollar in Marina. 
Here's what you will find happening right now at Del Valle Gunsmithing. Mention you heard Ray on KSEO, and he will cover your California gun registration fees on in-store gun purchases. We all want to know who is going to take care of us, right? When it comes to your handguns and rifles, choose the family-owned gunsmith with a 30-year reputation of excellent service. We are Del Valle Gunsmithing at 224 Rhinedollar in Marina. Drop by Del Valle Gunsmithing and get to know us. 831-384-1911. That's 384 384- 1911 or Del Valle Have you noticed that food just doesn't taste good anymore? Why is that? If you eat food, you'll want to know this. Our fruits, grains, and vegetables contain less and less nutrition every year. Chances are even your organic plants don't have anywhere near the 70-plus minerals that make a plant healthy and delicious. Listen up, home gardeners, farmers, growers, and lovers of good food. This is Andy Anderson telling you that you can go beyond organic. Perk up your plants and revitalize your fields with blooming minerals from Longevity. This marvelous soil conditioner will re mineralize your soil with up to 76 organically bound earth elements. That means healthier and better looking crops that resist bugs, mold, cold, and other nasties that can wipe you out. Commercial farmers are reporting faster growth, more yield, and higher brick scores. That means better tasting food for you and me. Get Bloomin' Minerals in powder and liquid form from a spray bottle for houseplants to 55-gallon drums for professional growers. Call us now to order toll-free, 888-245-0300. That's 888-245-0300. We all know what guide dogs for sight-impaired people look like and understand the jobs they perform. But in recent years, we've seen a huge increase in designated working animals. What are they and what sorts of services do they perform? This Saturday on Stepping In with Nurse Jackie Tucker, we'll learn about service dogs and therapy dogs, the differences between them, and the ways they can improve the lives of the humans they serve. That's Stepping In with Jackie Tucker, 3 until 4 this Saturday on KSCO. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, our guest today is whistleblower protection expert Stephen Cohn. Now, who investigates government whistleblower complaints, and, and, and do you have any idea how many cases come to fruition and lead to change versus those that are just dismissed? Okay. When you have what I would call due process, meaning you have a legitimate ability to raise a claim, and you have someone to hear it and review it, on the average, 20% of the whistleblowers prevail, uh, and 80% don't. So it's a difficult case no matter what because of the a lot of the facts are stacked against you. But that's an oversimplification and generalization because it includes some really terrible laws that have extremely low recoveries. Mm-hmm. Which brings you to the first part of your question, where do you go? Again, you have 50 laws. They're telling you to go 50 different places. The biggest and best places to go right now is the Securities and Exchange Commission for Securities Fraud and Foreign Corruption. That's a If you go there, that's considered law enforcement, so you're covered under obstruction. They also have a great whistleblower program. They have a separate office. They guarantee anonymity and confidentiality. They're actually state-of-the-art, best place to go. Mm -hmm. You can go to the U.S. Department of Justice for government contracting, Medicare, Medicaid fraud, some very good laws there, historically some of the best. And from there, it kind of starts going down. The Commodities for Commodities has a decent office. The IRS has a, a good whistleblower office. Those are the four best. After that, it's very much hit and miss. The U.S. Department of Labor has a whole whistleblower program also, and they are, they're doing much better now, but it often for them depends on who's in office. If, uh, it, unfortunately, there have been some terrible appointees over there. They haven't been so good, and you get some better appointees. Hit and miss at the Labor Department right now, it's okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, other than that, it's really just what the law, where the law tells you to go. Now, tell us about the Merit Systems Protection Board. Okay, that is one of the worst places to go. I hate to say. <laughs> okay, okay so I'm glad we got that straight. Way back out. when, way back when in 1978, 
when they passed the Civil Service Reform Act and created that board, was actually considered good. But mark my word, in 1978, whistleblower laws were non-existent. When I started practicing law in 84, uh, there were more whistleblower laws, but I don't use any of them anymore. They're all old, archaic, and not as good as the ones that were passed later on. Because what happened was, as people realized how important whistleblowers were, they passed better laws. So the good laws are all modern. Merit Systems Protection Board is one of the first. So it tells you it's one of the worst. Here's why. It covers federal employees, but the board is inherently political. The president sitting in office always has a majority of the board. There are three members, two appointed by the party in power. But federal employee whistleblowers may be embarrassing to the political party in office. That's who they're blowing the whistle on. So the board to hear the whistleblower's case is always stacked by the sitting administration. So these aren't real judges. They're, they don't go through judicial confirmation. They don't sit for life. They're political appointees. And I will tell you right now, politics and whistleblowers is oil and water. If you politicize a whistleblower case, it is absolutely disastrous. Whistleblowing is about good government. It's about accountability. It's about law enforcement. It should be completely apolitical. So the merit systems process throws the whistleblower into a process and, and a procedures that are inherently political. That is telling you you're, you're, it's, a, it's a train wreck waiting to happen. Well, as it proof of your point, uh, in the past 15 years, the Merit Systems Protection Board has heard 56 cases and ruled in favor of whistleblowers only three times. Yeah, and, and, and the numbers may even be worse than that. It's a, it's a terrible situation over there. We do not recommend it. Unfortunately, many federal employees have nowhere else to go, and that's really one of the saddest parts. People, you know, back in 78, there was such a recognition of the need to protect federal employees who were whistleblowers. So they passed a law. At that time, there were no laws for tax, for securities, for government contractors. There was no laws for private sector. So over time, you learn what works and don't, doesn't work, and as you pass new laws, you fix them. But for many whistleblowers who got protections under those early laws, they've never been amended. They're the worst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2011, President Obama appointed special counsel dedicated to whistleblower rights, uh, Carolyn Lerner. Uh, who was confirmed by the Senate. Have you noticed any improvements which might cause you to modify your tips for whistleblowers? Well, the Lerner administration has been doing better than I think any of the others who've held that office. And just so your listeners know, the Office of Special Counsel, that's an office that's supposed to protect whistleblowers. And they could take a whistleblower case before the Merit Systems Protection Board. The MSPB is like the judge. But the Office of Special Counsel can be a prosecutor to protect whistleblowers, try to mediate cases, and defend the process. Uh, she, in my view, is the best at, that we've seen. But once again, she's been appointed by the president, and she most likely will be looking for a reappointment by the president. So because it's a presidential appointed position, and that's the party in power, there are inherent conflicts. But I'll say she's doing a very good job. And uh, the second problem with Office of Special Counsel right now, because she's been doing a better job, the number of cases has gone way high, sky high, and the backlog is terrible. So, uh, you know, we file a case there, and it's hard to get an, an investigator on it. It takes forever. So, again, the, the, the systemic problems going all the way back to 1978 – have not been addressed. A good appointee, and she is a good appointee, can't fix them without Congress's help. So if you're a federal employee or a subcontractor like an Edward Snowden, uh, where would you recommend they go? To the Office of Special Counsel? Is that Should that be your first stop? Yeah, if you're a federal employee, that's where you go. 
Uh, there are some exceptions, like under the environmental laws, you can go to the Department of Labor. And sure. there are some exceptions, and that's usually better if you can find an exception. But 99% federal employees to Office of Special Counsel. Now, contractors are different. If you're blowing the whistle on contracting fraud, meaning someone got a contract and they're not doing what they're supposed to do, they're putting in the cheaper cement, they're not building something to specifications, they lied to get the contract, then you can be covered under the, one of the best whistleblower laws ever called the False Claims Act. Mm -hmm. This law has historically been the best law for whistleblowers. So it, it kicks in whenever taxpayer money is being ripped off. So, and that usually is in the context of a government contractor. It can also be in procurement if someone's selling the government lousy products. It's Medicare and Medicaid. It's a very broad law, the best one. It's treble damages. It lets the whistleblower get rewards, monetary rewards. It has some good confidentiality provisions. Mm -hmm. Excellent law. Well, this goes back to what you were saying, that the laws that govern fraud, uh, fraudulent behavior, where the economic consequences can be descri properly described and the damages properly described, are uh, much tighter than those that, such as that would cover a, a Snowden case, for example, where you're disclosing just general government misconduct. Uh, and it's questionable whether under the Patriot Act the NSA had those rights or not. Um, now we have to take our last break, but stay right where you are. We'll be back after these important messages from our sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. Caraccioli Cellars recently celebrated the fifth anniversary of their tasting room. This is what Enophiles had to say. Anna Russell, I love Caraccioli wine because I love the San Lucia Highlands, and I think this is a particularly great representation of what SLH can do that's different, um, using the most common grapes, Pinot and, and Chardonnay, and making something really beautiful and different in the area. I love the wine, so I always come back to almost every one of their events. My name is Jenny Franklin. I like it because it's very flavorful. It just is a good pinot. It goes down without touching any sides. It's very good. Full of lace. I really like the Brut Rosé. I like the older varietals too. I think it's just the way they manufacture it, the way that it uh, they produce it is old world style, and I enjoy that. Visit the Caraccioli Tasting Room on Dolores Street in Carmel-by-the-Sea or find us online at caracciolicellars.com or reach us by phone at 831-622-7722. If you're wondering what to do with all that data you're creating, do I have an offer for you? Tableau is drag-and-drop software that people of any skill level can use to analyze and turn data into something actionable. That's right. I said actionable. And isn't that what all that data is for? With Tableau, you can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, even big data sources are instantly combined into usable charts, graphs, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data and drag-and-drop at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. But the most impressive thing about Tableau is that anyone can use it. And just to prove the point, you can get a free 14-day trial from Tableau just by mentioning you heard this ad. But do it now because this offer won't last. For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at tableau.com slash Costa. That's tableau.com slash Costa. Tableau Software. What's your data trying to tell you? Want to know who's going to make Cleveland rock? It ain't Hendricks or Clapton. It's this guy. We're going to win. Oh, are we going to win? Donald Trump accepts his party's nomination tonight at the Republican National Convention. There's something happening. There's a movement going on. One of the most anticipated political events of all time is here. And it's coming to CNN for one more huge night with access you can't get anywhere else. We start with breaking news. Republican National Convention. Final night coverage starts today, 4 Eastern on CNN. If if you're the type of person who likes to volunteer and help others, this should interest you. What better way to help people than to help them overcome their health challenges? Longevity has been helping people overcome their health challenges 
for years. Our approach to health is drastically different than medical doctors who mostly only treat symptoms. As a veterinarian, Dr. Joel Wallach discovered that many common disease states are actually preventable and reversible. Our mission at Longevity is to educate Americans about their own health. If you like helping people, join us in our fight to save America. While you're helping people prevent and overcome health challenges, you will also be able to build a lucrative home-based business. So what are you waiting for? Come join us and help save America. For more information or to order, call Andy or Phyllis Anderson at 888-245-0300. That's 888-245-0300. I'm Steph. I'm Rob. And And we're we're out out in in Santa Santa Cruz. Cruz. Every Saturday at 7 p.m., we explore local, national, and global LGBTQ stories and interview the newsmakers you don't want to miss. It's fun. It's fabulous and even... (gasps) controversial he's the gay dad blogger and i'm the queer political sports fan out in santa cruz saturdays 7 p.m streaming and past shows on ksco.com Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and our guest today is Mr. Stephen Cohn. Now, Mr. Cohn, you mentioned that the first whistleblower uh, laws that were affected uh, were around 1978. But how about whistleblowers before that time? What happened to them? Well, you know, as I put out in my handbook, and it was actually the first time this story's ever been told, the first U.S. whistleblowers blew the whistle in 1777. Mm. They blew the whistle on the commander of the U.S. Navy in the Continental Army, the Continental Navy, the first commander. And they were blowing the whistle on things like the mistreatment of British prisoners. So it wasn't something that makes America look great. Mm -hmm. And these sailors went to the Continental Congress. They jumped ship and presented their petition. And it was the first time our government had to confront what essentially our federal workers, citizens, they were in the Navy and Marines, blowing the whistle on a high-ranking government official. And uh, to, just to run to the end of it, what our Continental Congress did was absolutely amazing. They supported the 10 whistleblowers. They did. The, they did. The commander was removed from his office. And when the commander went after the whistleblowers in the state of Rhode Island because his brother had been the governor, they were a rich and powerful family in Rhode Island, uh, so they got two of them arrested on seditious libel in Rhode Island and tossed in jail, the Continental Congress passed America's first whistleblower law calling upon all Americans to provide information about unlawful activities to appropriate authorities and voted money to defend those two whistleblowers. Now, remember, this was now in 1778, Mm -hmm. the height of the revolution. Every penny counted. They needed bullets. (laughs) And and, and the founding fathers would be hung for treason if they lost that war. So this isn't like a popularity contest or whether you're going down the polls or losing an election. They had it all out there. Mm -hmm. Yet they voted money to defend those whistleblowers, and they were found not guilty and released. They also released all the documents about the case, Mm -hmm. including the allegations of the mistreatment of the prisoners. No one said, oh, Britain might use this against us, or this could harm us. No, They, they went for the truth, they defended the whistleblowers, and they passed America's first whistleblower law. It's stunning, and there's actually a, a website that we have that I call on people to look at and all about this event. And we've gotten the U.S. Senate to uh, uh, recognize this uh, three, t- three years in a row, declaring July 30th National Whistleblower Day, because guess what? It's unbelievable what they did. And that's uh, a website. It's just, uh, you can get to it at whistleblowers.org, but the website is uh, nationalwhistleblowerday.org. T- you'll get the whole story of what our founding fathers did and how they supported whistleblowers. Now, 
What do you say to the head of the CIA, the NSA, Homeland Security, Armed Forces, and other agencies that claim that if we make whistleblowing too safe, we're going to have thousands and thousands of people coming forward about everything these agencies are doing um, and violate every classified agreement that they have? How do you respond to that? Well, there's two. One is it's a lie that's never happened. Two, if you create safe and effective procedures, so what? In other words, if you have the safe and effective procedures, let them come in, let the proper analysts review it and make those determinations. And then if someone goes outside of those procedures, okay, go after them. But, what, but you need the safe and effective procedures. The second thing is, what are they saying about their own employees? <laughs> are they telling me that CIA agents and NSA agents who are supposed to be quintessential law enforcement professionals, the moment they get the right to blow the whistle, are going to start making up garbage and spinning off at the mouth? That's absolutely absurd. It's just not true. I've worked with high-level security officials, FBI, and other agencies, and these are some of the most mature, professional people. They're not blowing the whistle on garbage. When they risk their career and come forward, believe me, they're saying something. They're incredible sources of information. What they're saying is not true. They want to keep them quiet. They want to hide their own misconduct. They've sat back while other agencies have had to deal with whistleblowers and the embarrassment it may cause, they've gotten a free pass. Mm -hmm. But the American public is the big loser. Now, what's the most important reform you'd like to see when it comes to whistleblower protection? The most important single reform is to have financial incentives Mm -hmm. because people are afraid to blow the whistle. And the whistleblower has to put everything up front. They can lose their job, their career, and maybe they'll get it back. But it's a terrible situation to be in. So most people don't blow the whistle. If you have financial incentives based on, one, being right, two, high-quality information that actually leads to an enforcement action, what does that do? It incentivizes whistleblowers to only come forward, only risk their their jobs and careers if they have really good information. Mm -hmm. That weeds out a lot of the ridiculous cases and gets the information where it needs to go. That has worked in securities, government contracting, other areas. It should be implemented across the board. And then right next to that, you need a safe and effective way to raise those issues. Every law can have its own procedure. That's okay. If it's national security, it has to be tight. If it's automobile safety, you know, it goes to another place. But that's what you need. If you want to have effective law enforcement, effective anti-fraud, we know what to do. Let's get it done. So what I hear you saying, if, if I got this right, is that, number one, you've got to create a pathway. Because if you don't create a pathway you wind up with all of these one-off cases that put national security at risk. People are going to come forward, and you have no idea how they're going to come forward or what damage could be done if there's no, uh, uh, there's no pathway for people. And, uh, and number two, you've got to have some kind of financial incentive that neutralizes the uh, overwhelming potential for retaliation, losing your job, not getting promotions, and so on and so forth. Those two things sound very, very reasonable to me. Yeah, and and you're 100% correct. The pathway is step one, essential, and the incentives, because it's not just the risk. When, When we look at the numbers, and this has been studied, the overwhelming majority, 97% of the people who witness fraud and misconduct and illegal actions do not go to the government. They may go to their supervisor. So it's so clear that this army of potential informants, this army of people who know where the skeletons are. Mm -hmm. They're afraid. They're intimidated. So you need the incentive. Yes, I agree. Now, before we run out of time, do you have a website where listeners today can go to get more information about whistleblower protection? Yes, I would recommend two. First is the nonprofit National Whistleblower Center at whistleblowers, with an S, dot org. You can also go to my law firm, which is kkc.com mm-hmm. 
And on the on my law firm's website, you'll see a resources page. And that is where we spent a lot of time and effort trying to put together the laws, the reports, a lot of information, all free of charge about how to blow the whistle. And that's at kkc.com. Well, we are all out of time for today, but before we say goodbye, I do want to take a moment to thank you for your public service and making time to speak with us today. Thank you, Mr. Cohn. Well, thank you for your wonderful show. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Stephen Cohn, you email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We are all over the Internet, and we'd love to hear from you. And if you missed the full interview with Cohn or any of our other guests, you can download previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our YouTube channel. And while you're at our website... Please take a moment to check out The Watchman's Rattle, the first and only book that explains why every society, since the dawn of humankind, eventually reaches a point where there is a mass confusion between unproven beliefs and empirical facts. And if you've been watching the news lately, you know that that battle between facts and beliefs is being waged as we speak, and it is an irrational conflict. So stop by RebeccaCosta.com and pick up The Watchman's Rattle. My guest next week was unable to confirm with us prior to today's broadcast, so please check your local station for next week's topic and guest or visit our website at RebeccaCosta.com where you'll also find our guest bio. And you can catch up on news and information you won't find anywhere else. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Imagine hearing the words, your child has cancer. The emotional impact is staggering. They tell you that treatment may last for years. And you travel the long road between hospital and home. Your financial worries multiply. And you want to stay strong for everyone, especially your child. But nobody understands. Your friends and family don't get it. Where do you turn? For the last 18 years, Jacob's Heart has provided essential support to families enduring the unimaginable. We have been there from the time of diagnosis all the way through the course of treatment, regardless of the outcome. With no government funding and no reimbursement for services, Jacob's Heart relies 100% on support from our community to make miracles happen for families. Please support Jacob's Heart by going to our website, jacobsheart.org. Or call us at 831-724-9100. Make a difference in the life of a child. Thank you. This is Larry from Bullseye Archery in Scotts Valley. We carry compound bows, traditional bows, rests, anything you need for archery, and then some. If you're new to this sport, we offer lessons and carry all the products you will need for archery. We're located in Scotts Valley, 5299 Scotts Valley Drive. We are open Tuesday through Friday, 1 to 7, Saturday, 11 to 6. Bullseye Archery, the little shop with everything you could want in archery. Try us out. Every exam room I've ever been in in my life has a sink and a faucet, but they rarely ever use it. Two million infections each year in hospitals in America alone. There are 90,000 deaths from those infections each year. There's a yearly figure. Not one doctor gets their license suspended. Nobody gets fined. It's just absolutely incredible. What would happen if North Korea and Iran were to send over a biological weapon and, and infect two million people in a large population center and kill 90,000? It'd be war. Dead Doctors Don't Lie, the radio show, Monday through Friday at 12.06 on AM 1340. Surfing Northern California for over 65 years. This is KSCO Santa Cruz.